This is basically an adjuster's guide to the evaluation of permanent parent fourth edition. As you know, one of the biggest changes between the old law and the current new quote unquote new law is that we did away with disability ratings and we went with impairment ratings. This attempted to objectify certain parameters of the case to uh, establish uh, additional financial issues. However, um, there are some points I wanna bring out during the course of this talk. Going back, and I understand that we've been doing impairments for almost 30 years now, but we still have to understand the difference between disability and impairment. A disability is an inability to meet certain personal, social, or occupational demands. And on occasion, we still see some individuals who feel they should get more money because they can't go bowling on Tuesday nights or they can't do whatever, and that has a certain value to them, but not to the system. Where an impairment is defined as any loss or abnormality of a psychological, physiologic, or anatomic structure as noted on page one of the guides. The classic example I like to use is carpenter versus pianist. If I'm a carpenter and I do everything with my right hand, I hammer with my right hand, saw with my right hand, drink coffee with my right hand, and I happen to sustain an injury to my left pinky finger. And for the sake of argument, it's completely amputated. Well, that would be a 100% loss of the digit, which is a 9% loss to the hand, 8% upper extremity, and it's a five, I can't do that, 5% whole person impairment rating. But as a carpenter, I can go back to work. I don't know if any of you have any experience with individuals who work in the oil fields, but have you ever met an oil field worker who had all 10 digits? They don't. Really dangerous work, there's always injuries, but they don't have all 10 digits. But if you take the exact same injury, and I happen to be a concert pianist, Without that fifth digit, I can't hit those chords. I can't compete in the Van Cliburn up in Fort Worth. And yet I am out of a career. Now I could teach piano lessons, you know, for 30 bucks an hour or something like that, but I'm not gonna be in Carnegie Hall making the big bucks. The, the issue to make is that both impairment ratings, irrespective of the occupation are the same. Where one individual, the carpenter, he's not disabled at all, he's back at work, but that concert pianist is completely out of work as a concert pianist. It should be noted, I love saying this one part from page four of the guides, it should be noted that impairment percentages derived according to the guides should not be the basis for financial awards or direct estimates of disability, which is of course is exactly what we do using the impairment ratings to establish how many additional checks you get either in a, uh, a impairment income benefit or even a supplemental income benefit situation. There are specific reporting requirements that are incumbent upon the individuals providing the impairment rating, most predominantly the designated doctor, which obviously holds the most weight, and to a lesser extent, the treating provider. There needs to be sufficient medical and non-medical information presented to justify the impairment assessment. It can't be because I said so. Now, I know a lot of you out there have children. And I know that my father used to say, because I said so. And you're all smiling to yourself because you know you tell that to your children. But in my situation, when my father said, because I said so, only worked until I could outrun him. Once I was faster than he was, that didn't work. We have providers, I've actually seen providers say, because I said so, this should be a 50% impairment rating. They had no idea what they're talking about. This is why we went to the impairment rating process to get to sufficient medical and non-medical information to justify that impairment. This would include a complete historical assessment of the compensable medical condition, as well as an appropriate physical examination and a discussion of all diagnostic procedures. As we'll talk about later in radiculopathy, is there electrodiagnostic evidence of a verifiable radiculopathy? That is a huge question when it comes to establishing the final whole person impairment rating. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And as noted in the AMA guides, and I have to point this out, the impairment rating is to be done by physicians. Here in Texas, we know they're done by chiropractors. The purpose here for the impairment rating is that the same set of facts will equal the same impairment 
irrespective of the impairment rating provider. So that if I had that amputation of my fifth digit in Amarillo or in Brownsville, how far apart is that? It would be the exact same 5% whole person. And that we had issues before the old law where somebody hurt his back in Williamson County here in Central Texas, and they would get a 5% impairment rating, but down in McAllen or Laredo, oh, he's 100% disabled. And all of a sudden we're paying a buck a load of dough. And that precipitated the crisis we had in workers' compensation in the late 80s and early 90s here in Texas. Please remember that the final impairment rating is expressed in terms of a whole person impairment. I can remember, this hasn't happened in a number of years, but it, it was out there where people would say he's got an 11.6% impairment rating. That is not it. If it's 11.6, it gets rounded to 12. If it's 11.5, it gets rounded to, to 11. And that's it. It's a single, not a single digit. I meant to say a whole person impairment, a whole number is what I meant to say. The physical examination, the clinical assessment, the diagnostic testing should all be there to support the impairment rating. In short, when I review an impairment rating or one of my physicians review an impairment rating, we're gonna look at it and say, did this guy justify the assessment? And there are specific protocols to follow. And when they don't follow those protocols, that is quite often the basis for overturning that impairment rating. Each aspect of the impairment rating should be described fully. If it's a the guy has multiple injuries, it happens frequently. I stubbed my toe, I twisted my knee, I've got a low back injury and a shoulder injury. Each one of those impairments is broken apart, knee, twisting injury, it's based on one, two, and three. Back, DRE, one, two, or three, whatever the case may be. Shoulder, what goes into the shoulder. At that point, when those three components are assessed, then we know how to combine them and independently review the accuracy of the impairment rating. The purpose of the review is to establish the accuracy and the veracity of the impairment rating so that all appropriate rules and appeals panel decisions are followed. The impairment rating needs to be based on an evidence-based medicine reporting standard. That is not specifically noted in the guides, but it is in the workers' comp statute. Everything we do is a function of evidence-based medicine so that two providers can point to that data and say, yes, this person had a total knee arthroplasty and it was a good result. So that the facts are there and the hearing officer can apply the same set of facts and come up with the same number. Again, explain each aspect of the impairment rating and have that provider of the impairment rating refer to a specific table or a figure where those data points come from. Based on uh, table 64, it's a medial meniscus tear, 1% whole person impairment rating. Yes, that's accurate, that's correct, and we all can be happy with that. If he says, oh, he's got a knee injury, I'm gonna give him a 4% impairment rating, based on what? And there's a couple of ways, there's other things that contribute to it, which may or may not be accurate, but the reporting standard has to be there. Here are a couple of little impairment rating factoids. It is allowed that impairment rating values may be interpolated, that is rounded or uh, between the values, unless there's other instructions. I bring this up because with each aspect of the upper extremity impairment, every range of motion value has to be rounded to the nearest five degrees. And when we talk about the wrist, I'll, you'll see why there, that has been a problem in the past. In general, pain has been factored in the impairment rating. Oh, I didn't have pain before. I've got chronic pain now. I should get a higher impairment rating. No, the answer is no. To that end though, there is chapter 15 on chronic pain. However, the appeals panel has excluded chronic pain and the statute has excluded pain because pain is subjective and the impairment rating is based on objective clinical data. If I, we're talking about pain, everybody has a different threshold of pain. Uh, I would tell you that I could go play racquetball for an hour with a buddy of mine. We beat each other up. We hit each other in the head. We're bloody. We come out. That was a great racquetball game. And we go drink a beer. However, if my wife thinks about stubbing her toe, I'm doing the vacuuming for two weeks. There's no two ways about it. Her pain threshold is way, way down. Prosthetics. It depends how easily they're removed. If you have a hearing aid, you take the hearing aids out. However, if you have glasses, 
you leave your glasses on because it's best corrected vision. If you have a baloney amputation, it's the amputation that's impairable. It's not the fact that you're wearing a prosthetic device. Let's talk about the upper extremity. This is one of the situations where you really need to have the impairment rating provider examine the individual. The impairment rating is based on a physical examination and there are four components. First being amputation, we talked about that, pinky. Fingers gone, it's all healed up, amputation. The next part is sensory loss. Obviously, if it's an amputated, there's, there's complete sensory loss because the digit's missing. Range of motion, same drill. If there is a residual uh, aspect, you can use a range of motion model and ankylosis. And ankylosis is a complete lack of range of motion, both actively and passively. And we'll bring that up because active motion, I'm sorry, Active motion is what the injured individual can do. Uh, Donald, please bend your elbow. Okay, I can only bend it this far. So actively, I've got 90 degrees of flexion. However, the examiner comes up, grabs the elbow, and he goes to 140. Passively, he goes to 140 because that's what the examiner can do. Then there has to be a discussion in the narrative explaining why he can only do 90 degrees actively, but 140 degrees passively, because that's going to change the final impairment rating assessment. And again, we talked about active and passive, but multiple examinations. So if this individual has been going to physical therapy and his shoulder abduction was 90 degrees, but shoulder flexion was 180 degrees. But when he gets to the designated doctor, all of a sudden his abduction is 45 degrees and flexion is only 90 degrees, then the impairment rating is going to be much more elevated. So therefore, there has to be a question, well, how come he was uh, at the physical therapist doing 180 degrees of flexion, but for the designated doctor, it's only 90 degrees and it's a much higher impairment rating. Hands. And with the hands, we do the digits first. Start with the digits. And this is where it, it, it's really clear I, to get off track here a little bit, make sure that the exact extent of the compensable injury is established. So we have this little old lady here who I can tell you has significant arthritis in her MCP joints, as you can see right through here, and a little bit here in the IV joint. And if the, if the range of motion is a function of the uh, arthritis, that's a consideration. But her, if her injury was limited to just the fifth digit, then you don't get impairment ratings for the ring finger, middle finger, and the index finger. And we see that quite frequently Oh, she had a, a sprained finger, but they're giving range of motion losses, uh, this arthritic digits of the other thing, inflating the impairment rating. So be very clear that you establish the exact extent of the injury. So in terms of the digits, amputation, range of motion, sensory loss, and then there are some diagnosis-related impairments that can be assigned. If there was a complete amputation right through, these are called the MCP joints right here. And if, if all the digits were missing right through the MCP joints, that would be a 90% hand impairment, 81% upper extremity, and a 49% whole person impairment rating just by losing those digits. Range of motion, it's a matter of flexion and extension of each of the joints. So we have the, right here, it's the DIP joint. Here it's the PIP joint. Here it's the MCP joint. So you do flex, you get an impairment rating for flexion, and if there is a lack of extension, you get an impairment rating for that. Those two values get added. You do the same thing for the uh, PIP joint and the MCP joint. So now you've got three values and those three values are combined. And this is a common error. People get confused whether should I add or combine. And when the values are smaller, there's no difference. But if the values get above eight or 9%, they get, the, the net result is smaller. So that if I had a 7% for the PIP and a 7% for the uh, DIP, that would be a 14% digit impairment. But if there was an 8% for the DIP and a 7% for the PIP, those two values are combined for a 14% impairment rating and now 15%, and therefore the impairment rating ultimately will be lower. So it is a point that we, we look at real closely because a lot of providers could get that confused. And as I mentioned earlier, ankylosis, no motion whatsoever. So for the sake of argument, this lady had a crush injury to the PIP joint 
and there was no motion whatsoever. The fracture healed and she didn't do her physical therapy and it just sticks out there straight, okay? That's ankylosis and that's a much more inflated and perforating because the functionality of the digit is markedly reduced. Sensory loss is based on two-point discrimination and there's a number of medical tools we can use. Some people even use a paperclip and bend the paperclip. The idea is that how far apart are these two points where I can perceive them and therefore calculate impairment rating. If the distance is six, six millimeters or less, that is no functional impairment. If it's between seven millimeters and 15 millimeters, then it's a partial impairment and greater 15 is complete sensory loss. The difficulty is what do you do when somebody absolutely says, no, oh, I can't feel that. I can't feel that. And, and a complete sensory loss for the entire digit is reported. Then the question has to be, what's the objective basis or the clinical basis for that sensory loss? There's no nerve root involvement. There's no peripheral nerve involvement. And it's just based on a guy who's being stoic and saying, I can't feel that. Having said that, I can tell you, I had a personal experience where I was doing a sensory loss and this was not an impairment rate situation. It was an emergency room a number of years ago. And I'm, I'm testing this individual who tells me that he can't feel anything. And I'm climbing up his arm and I'm not believing him because it doesn't make any sense until I saw the little droplets of blood. I was really stabbing him pretty good. It turned out he had shredded his brachial plexus and basically had a functionless arm. But there, we discovered, my point is being, we discovered a, a clear clinical explanation why there was no sensory function that entire upper extremity. If there is a reason for it, there was a you know, person had lacerated the uh, radial nerve of the hand. Obviously that's gonna affect the sensory function of the uh, fifth digit and that makes sense. But if there's no injury like that or no explanation, then it requires an additional investigation. And there's multiple diagnoses that can be function, rotational deformities and things like that. Just wanted to make sure you understood there were things out there. Relative to the wrist, again, it's amputation and range of motion. There are four separate planes of motion, flexion, extension, ulnar deviation, and radial deviation. Quite frequently, providers will say, oh, she had a wrist injury, uh, a Collie's fracture. And that wrist injury resulted in a loss of pronation and supination. As per the guides, pronation and supination is assigned to the elbow. So if this was a wrist injury alone, they do not get an award for pronation and supination. So be very clear to the provider, there's no elbow injury. That excludes pronation and supination, which will keep the impairment rating down by a few points. So to fully explain here, flexion, if we start in the, this plane right here, we're straight and I bend it towards the palm, that's wrist flexion. Relative to extension, again, a straight line here and I bend it towards the back of the hand, that's wrist extension. This is also called dorsiflexion as well, just to make it a little bit more confusing. Again, with the upper extremity straight and I bend it towards the thumb, that's radial deviation. With the extremity straight and I bend it towards the fifth digit, that's ulnar deviation, okay? Pronation and supination are part of the examination, but again, for the purposes of impairment, that's ascribed to the elbow and not the wrist. Quickly on carpal tunnel syndrome, the good news is the number of cases of carpal tunnel syndrome is decreasing exponentially, if that's possible. Uh, when I first started working in workers' comp, it was a very common diagnosis. And now with the literature, with the advent of evidence-based medicine, the literature supports that you do not get carpal tunnel syndrome from dead entry for 20 minutes this morning and don't like your new job. If you see a diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome, you need to contest it. Nine times out of 10, it's not a function of the compensable event. It can occur, but it's not always there. If you have accepted that diagnosis, there are two separate methodologies. And the best method is to use tables 11 and 12, which is lies the maximums for motor loss and sensory loss, and multiply by a value from table 15, which is a grade loss. Unfortunately, in the fourth edition of the guides, there's table 16 and the appeals panel has ruled and for your benefit, it's great because table 16 is very generous. 
is not the basis for the impairment rating. Let me show you real quickly here. Here's the median nerve in the wrist. And of course, you can see the, the median nerve innervates the thumb, the index, and the middle finger. It's a little bit on the ring finger, but because it's a, an offshoot of this one, it really doesn't do that much to the ring finger. So if somebody says, oh, my whole hand hurts, or my whole hand is numb, then they don't have carpal tunnel syndrome because the median nerve doesn't innervate the pinky or this part of the hand, okay? I want to show you really quickly what it, here's the normal anatomy and you can see this thin white line right through here and that's the carpal or transverse ligament. Within there, you got the bones underneath it and all these tendons that make your digits move up and down. And as you can see here, this little golden spot, that's the median nerve. So when this space between these bones and this transverse ligament is compromised, that is it's shrunken down, then that's, cause, that's the cause of carpal tunnel syndrome. That does not happen acutely, with the exception of if there was a fracture of these bones pushing against that nerve, that would be an acute carpal tunnel syndrome. And that's a very infrequent cause that would be a compensable event. So as you can see here, here's the tunnel. And this is why we call it carpal tunnel syndrome. This space gets compromised. I can tell you from personal experience, having done this surgery, this ligament can get very, very thick. And when you do, and you, when we divide this ligament, it pops open, yay. All of these structures have a place to go. They stretch out, they're happy campers, and it relieves it. If you don't do it quickly enough, that would cause scarring to the nerve itself, and the nerve doesn't come back. So you can have, if it's a chronic carpal tunnel syndrome, you can have symptomology even after surgery. It doesn't happen all that often, but it's out there. I want to point out, here, the, the, this is the thenar eminence, the big muscle in your bone. This individual has a bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. Look at the atrophy. If you compare this, this picture to your hand and you saw how beefy this was, as opposed to this one, yikes. This person has a bad news bear situation. This is a protracted situation and can be problematic, but it takes a good long time to develop. Therefore, it's not your injury and 99% of the time. The elbow, amputation, and when they say amputation, it's just on a, it's a, just where the elbow, uh, the, the condyle is, just short of that, if the amputation there, that's a 58% old person in impairment rating. Thank God we don't see too many elbow injuries or amputations of the other arm there. Otherwise, you can see why. If you lose that upper extremity, whoa, that is a huge functional loss. Range of motion, again, there are four components, flexion, extension, pronation and supination. This is where pronation and supination belong. So if you have an elbow injury and they cannot pronate and supinate, I'll show you here right quick. Here's pronate, if the palm is, the thumb is pointing to the ceiling and your pinky finger is pointing to the floor and you rotate towards the palm, that's called pronation. The other direction is called supination and we measure that with a goniometer and depending on the amount of motion they have, that's the basis for impairment rating. Again, Here's just the arm, and as we bend it towards the shoulder, that's flexion, and does it go back here? That's extension. Now, 100 degree, uh, zero degrees is that. Some people will describe it as 180 degrees, but that's the same as saying zero degrees of flexion, okay? The arm itself has what we call a normal carrying angle of approximately 25 degrees. So if you just naturally hang your arm at your side, there will be 25 degrees of elbow flexion there. But for purposes of impairment, you have to go to zero before you get a 0% impairment rating. But again, there's only four components of range of motion. The shoulder, amputation, and amputation at the level of the axilla. So where, where your armpit is, if your arm is amputated at that level, that would be a 60% whole person impairment rating. But relative to the shoulder, range of motion is key. And again, there's six planes of motion, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, internal and external rotation. So as we look at this diagram, flexion, we start along the side of the body. And as we go forward and up, maximum is 180 degrees, okay? If we can only go to 90 degrees, that's an imperable event. Extension is the same line, but going rearward. And obviously you only have 20 or 30 degrees of extension normally. Abduction, we start in the midline, 
Going away from the midline is abduction. Going towards the midline is adduction, AD deduction. And again, impairment running values for how much they can do. Just to show pronation and supination, but that's not part of it. In terms of external and internal rotation, the purpose is you elevate the shoulders to 90 degrees with the palm to the floor. External rotation, the hand goes up towards the ceiling. Internal rotation, the hand goes down to the floor and you, and you measure a range of motion at the elbow. So there needs to be six different parameters measured to assign a proper range of motion impairment rating for the shoulder. There's two other things I want to show you about the shoulder. First one is rotator cuff tears. Statistically, 45% of the population over the age of 40 has a rotator cuff tear. They just happen. If you use your shoulder for writing, for bowling, picking up a carton of milk, whatever, with time, it's going to wear out. And when it wears out, it tears. So just because they have a rotator cuff injury does not mean it's a compensable event. This is when you really need to look at the MRI and look to see if there are T2 or STIR images documenting markers of acute injury, particularly in somebody who's 68 years old, five feet, four inches, and weighs about 300 pounds. That has a, that's a worn out shoulder and it's not necessarily. Now, does it require surgery? In some cases, yes, some cases, no. But is it your, really your injury? And just as an example, excuse me, <coughs> just as an example, here's a pretty significant tear. And this is called a full thickness tear. As you can see, this white spot right here, that's the humeral head. So this is an, based on this drawing, I mean, this redness here, there's bleeding, this would be an acute tear. But if there was no redness and there was just what we call a rent, R-E-N-T, yeah, I know, uh, a rent in the system, without this redness, without swelling in the joint here, that's not an acute lesion, that's a degenerative process and that's not your pathology, okay? So the point here is if there's a rotator cuff tear, it may require surgery, maybe not depending on the age and a few other factors. However, make sure it's your pathology. The other thing that I'm really going to stress here is distal clavicle resection. Now, when the guides were written 30 years ago, yeah, they were written 30 years ago. Can't do anything about that. But we did a procedure called a Mumford procedure. And you can see right here, here's the distal end of the clavicle and it's been cut off. It was a huge, not a huge operation, but a significant surgery because we didn't have any other way to decrease this joint space and make it easier to move around because just about every motion mucks around with the AC joint. But again, if you've got arthritis in the AC joint and I'm gonna do a rotator cuff repair here as a competent surgeon, I'm gonna take this apart. And with the advent of arthroscopy and the little tools that we can use, I can put a burr in there and kind of shave off a couple of millimeters. Technically, that's a distal clavicle resection and would warrant a 10% upper extremity or a 6% whole person impairment rating. Whoa, six points on top of the range of motion loss for this one over here. And now you're staring at a 15% impairment rating and that opens up a whole different can of worms that we don't wanna talk about in this conversation. Therefore, what I'm telling you is that anytime you have a shoulder injury, file the PN11 and exclude a chromioclavicular joint arthritis. File it. Worst case scenario, it's proven to be yours and you can take the file, it, it comes off the table. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. But I'm here to tell you, if anybody over the age of 30 probably has an element of our a rotator cuff, I'm sorry, a chromial clavicular joint arthritis, and if it does go to surgery, there's gonna be a distal clavicle resection and you're gonna save yourself a whole lot of points because even if they do it, it's not treating the compensable injury and it's not the basis for an impairment rating, so we knock that down. But we see that I, as recently as this morning, we were, I was doing a case and it was that exact situation. The x-ray documented severe arthritis of the acromioclavicular joint on the date of injury. You don't get arthritis in six hours, simple as that. When it went to surgery, they did the distal clavicle resection and all of a sudden the impairment rating is elevated. There you go. Motor and sensory, relatively straightforward. You use table 10 to determine where the actual functional loss is. And then you go to table 15. 
So if I had a median nerve lesion, a sensory loss of the median nerve at the wrist, the maximum award is 38% upper extremity. And then you use table 11 to grade it. Now, be very careful when they're grading it because some providers say, oh, he's got a, a moderate sensory loss for 40%. Well, 40% times 38% comes out to 15% upper extremity, which by itself is a 9% whole person impairment rating, plus the motor function loss and everything else. So be very clear. A lot of providers, particularly non-physician providers who do this, go with their gut in terms of severity and don't note the definitions of how a grade one or grade two or a grade three loss is. So therefore, note the, the severity of the grade loss and the definitions before you sign them and do the multiplication. Same process for motor function. You go to table 15 to get a maximum award times uh, a grade loss from sensory table 12. You multiply these two and you get two values. Then you've got two upper extremity values which get combined via the combined value start for a neurologic impairment rating for the upper extremity. In those situations where both the motor and sensory loss and the range of motion are, those two separate upper extremity impairments are again combined with the, the combined values chart. Make sure they're combining when they're supposed to be combining and not adding when they're not adding, okay? It's a little bit confusing here and it does throw some folks off. Other issues in the upper extremity to include crepitation, arthritis. If they have arthritis, chances are it's not yours, but make sure it's not yours. Synovial hypertrophy, long-term degenerative changes, not your pathology. It can serve as the basis for impairment rating, but not if, it, if the impairment rating has to be limited to your injury. Again, this speaks to making sure that the, whoever providing the impairment rating understands the accepted compensable injury. Rotational deformity, uh, in the hand, you've got long bones. Uh, you can break a bone in your hand, and because of the anatomy, it can hit in a rotated fashion, kind of like, going around a, a, a candy cane, you see their lines going around a candy cane in a rotational fashion. When you rotate the bone in your hand, that, that can compromise the functionality of the finger. So rotational deformity is a big issue. Joint subluxation, who here has watched Die Hard, uh, I'm sorry, not Die Hard, Lethal Weapon about a million times, and where a guy can, some people can just dislocate their shoulders at will. Joint subluxation, for whatever reason, is an impairable event. Same thing with carpal instability. And table 27, arthroplasty. And this includes arthroplasty from the digits all the way to the shoulder and the acromioclavicular joint. So if I have an arthroplasty, in addition to the arthroplasty, I get a range of motion loss. So as an example, somebody had a fracture of the radial head and it was crunched up and they had to put in a, a arthroplasty, a device, because the fracture couldn't be, it was in too many pieces. So not only do you get the arthroplasty impairment, you also get the range of motion impairment and the total shoulder. How often do we see total shoulders or reverse total shoulders in older individuals? So a reverse total shoulder is a 30% upper extremity impairment rating plus the range of motion. And all of a sudden you're staring at a 25 or a 30% whole person impairment rating depending on the individual factors. So because table 27 exists and you get range of motion with table 27, Make sure that you're dealing with your pathology. There is a uh, impairment for grip strength. And again, if they use that, this is a huge red flag because grip strength is a function of the individual being tested. So if I had a, you know, a, a styrofoam coffee cup, where, where am I handed? A styrofoam coffee cup, and I go, oh, oh, I can't crush that little styrofoam coffee cup. Their grip strength is really down low and the impairment will really, really be high. Wait a minute, who can't crush a styrofoam coffee cup? But if they can't, there has to be an objective clinical basis for that. And make sure if they're gonna use things like grip strength, make sure there's a clinical basis for, for that particular uh, functional loss. That's the upper extremity. Now we'll talk about the lower extremity for a minute. There are multiple ways to address the impairment rating. In fact, 64 possible methods for assessing a lower extremity impairment rating. Think about all the people you know who've done kind of squirrely impairment ratings and they get it wrong when there's only one way to do it. Now there's 64 ways to do it. It gets really pretty confusing. There is a grid matrix in the fifth edition of the guides. And if you need a copy, 
please send me an email, let me know, and I'll send you back a copy of the grid matrix. But while we can't use the fifth edition, the data is the same, and the appeals panel has referred to the grid matrix. What this does is it tells you when you can combine two different methodologies. So if you're using a table 64 award, you don't get a range of motion award. Conversely, if you're using, if you're giving it a, for arthritis, you don't, you can get range of motion. So there's a lot of different things, a lot of different factors in there that go into determining the proper method for assessing that impairment rating. So get a copy of that grid matrix so you get a sense of what can be combined and what cannot, what cannot be combined. There are multiple other diagnoses, section 3.28, limb length discrepancies. You could have that if somebody had a fractured hip and they put in a total hip replacement and there's one leg is two inches shorter than the others. That can serve as the basis of impairment rating. It is frequent that people will use section 3.2B for gait derangement. Oh, he needs crutches to ambulate. Why? Well, he's more comfortable or it's easier. That's not a clinical basis for using crutches. However, you, the use of crutches can be a 20% impairment rating. Yeah, that's right, 20%. If they're using section 3.2B, there better be a very good reason to do that. And you really need to make sure and talk to somebody to make sure it's an accurate utilization of that section. Atrophy, people get lower extremity injuries. They don't rehab well, the muscles go away. And then that's a, that also can serve as a base impairment rating. Range of motion, fairly common. One of the advantages of the range of motion aspect, it must be consistent between two separate evaluators. Ooh, let's say I'm going to physical therapy. I really want to impress the therapist. I'm working hard. My knee flexion's 110 degrees. Oh, it's great. Except now I'm going for my impairment rating. Hmm, impairment rating means money. So if I don't participate, then I get more money. Makes sense. So my all of a sudden my knee flexion is only... 40 degrees. Well, because there's a disparity of more than one grade loss, that's a basis to invalidate, invalidate the entire range of motion aspect. And there have been a number of appeals panel decisions that have supported that very position. Joint ankylosis. And we see this commonly, people are confusing joint ankylosis with what we call an extension lag. A joint ankylosis means there's no motion whatsoever. Frequently, some people will get, develop a, a capsular issue or, or uh, other, other extraneous issues and limit the range of motion, or it's uncomfortable. So they don't fully extend their knees or fully extend their hip actively, but passively they can. So the question becomes, is it a, a, an ankylosis or is it an extension lag? And on a number of occasions, uh, we, we asked that question and it came out, oh, yeah, passively this guy goes out to full extension. Well, therefore, it's an extension leg and the impairment rating is zero and not 15 or 20% of what the case may be. Arthritis can serve, depending on the severity, as a basis for impairment rating. So the question becomes, and I was just working on a case yesterday, this is a, a little lady who had bad hip arthritis on the date of injury, yet the, the treating doctor wanted to assign the arthritis as part of the impairment. It's not your injury. It didn't, it was there on the date of injury. There's no way you cause it or exacerbated or aggravated it. And we can, there are methods to, to establish that, that arthritis can serve as a base of impairment rating, table 62, but is it really yours? And again, establishing the extent of injury. Amputations are really straightforward. And as I mentioned earlier, the preferred method is table 64. It, it will tell you, here's the diagnosis, here's the whole person impairment rating, see you later. Straightforward going through. It's when people are not happy with the impairment rating that they get look crazy. Uh, if somebody had a medial meniscus injury and it was treated with arthroscopy, by standard, it's a partial meniscectomy and that's a 1% impairment rating. However, uh, the injured employee, <coughs> excuse me, the injured employee, um, uh, six foot tall, 300 pound guy who doesn't have, uh, he only has a hundred, 109 degrees of flexion. Well, that would be a 4% impairment rating under the range of motion model. And some people will default on that. However, the impairment rating must be based on the compensable injury. 
and a compensable injury is the medial meniscus tear and not the arthritis or other factor or the obesity or, or whatever causing the range of motion loss. So, oh, well, let's give them 4% as opposed to 1%. And we know there's guys who think that way. Their, their job is like, you guys have nothing but deep pockets and all they want to do is hand out your money, okay? My job is to make sure it's accurate and consistent with the specific parameters noted in the guides. The hip, range of motion at table 40. Now, I put an asterisk here because just the other day, the appeals panel came up with a distinct departure from what the guides say. The guides are clear. You measure all six planes of range of motion, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, internal, external rotation, and then you assign them to a category, mild, moderate, or severe. You only get one of those and it's the most one. So if I had five planes of motion that were mild and one plane of motion that was severe, I would get the severe range of motion loss. The appeals panel has recently declared that you get it for each plane of motion, which is not what the guides say. If you read the black letter law, it's clear, okay? You only get one. The appeals panel has changed that. And now if you had six planes of motion and they're all mild, you would get a 12% impairment rating as opposed to the 2% impairment rating. Ankylosis, depending on the position of ankylosis, doesn't happen very often, but guy's in a car accident and he just trashes his hip and he's stuck in flexion of 20 degrees. You get the ankylosis on, on table 46 for flexion of 20 degrees and that's the apparent, it's a pretty stout impairment rating, but that's it. You don't get it for the other planes of motion because there's no other motion if it's ankylosed. But again, that, that's the narrative how, how you do that. And here we have flexion. Again, if the leg is straight, bringing the knee towards the abdomen, that's flexion. Going towards the buttocks, that would be extension. Abduction, again, straight leg away from the body would be abduction, abduction. Towards the body would be AD, adduction. And they call it outward rotation. We call it external rotation. Inward is, uh, inward rotation is internal rotation. Again, that's just a verbiage that different providers use. The knee, table 64, diagnosis related, covers just about everything you kind of need. Table 64 excludes a range of motion impairment, as we mentioned a few minutes ago. However, if there are multiple diagnoses, you can get multiple impairments from table 64. In this case, the individual had an anterior cruciate ligament tear and instability or elements of laxity, plus a medial meniscus tear. You would get both. If they had two separate structural changes, you would get both. But we would not get range of motion. If they did range of motion, you don't get the table 64 awards. And I wanted to point out real quickly, again, a picture of the arthroscope here. And in this case, you still see this little bit of white stuff here on both sides. That is what some people would call a partial or subtotal meniscectomy. I bring that up because if it's a partial meniscectomy, it is a 1% impairment rating. A complete meniscectomy, total meniscectomy, is a 4% impairment rating. We don't do that. We come to learn over the last number of years that you leave as much cartilage behind to, as a shock absorber between the tibial plateau and the femoral condyle. I would tell you that when I first started our practice in 1979 at a PA school and we do a surgery, we took out the entire meniscus because we believed at that time that there was no blood supply that if you took out a part of it, it would just die and go south. We've come to learn there is a blood supply and you leave as much as you possibly can the shock absorber effect so that people didn't go to arthritis of the knee uh, and things like that. To be clear, there are studies that say that if you have a medial meniscus tear, you can exacerbate or potentiate arthritis, which will lead to a total knee replacement arthroplasty. So I'm, I'm putting that out there. If somebody had a medial meniscus tear, and 10 years later, they come back and they're knocking on your door. Oh, I need a total knee and I need you guys to pay for it. <clears throat> He's got a valid argument. You know, you can make that argument. Now, the difference is if they had pre-existing arthritis, is it because of the meniscus tear or the pre-existing arthritis? And that's a clinical situation that needs to be resolved. But you need to be aware that in a, an otherwise pristine knee with a medial meniscus tear, it can potentiate 
uh, the need for a total knee arthroplasty in the future. And this is a drawing. I just wanted to show you goniometers measuring the range of motion. Here's a, a svelte individual with a full extension. And depending on how much they can bend their knee back, that's what the impairment rating would be based on. Ankle has diagnosis related impairments and range of motion impairments. There's dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, inversion and eversion. These are four separate planes of motion. And again, there's different tables and you get mild, moderate, severe. It, it, that's out there. I'm not clear how that current appeals panel decision from the hip as noted by, uh, recently published would affect this, but it could be, I don't, we don't know yet. But again, I just wanna show you dorsal flexion that's bringing foot is flat, bringing it towards your nose, that's dorsal flexion. Plantar flexion is becoming a ballerina. Does anybody know how they go on point? I can't figure that out. It just looks too painful to me, but we, I watch them all the time, particularly at Christmas time, and you see them going on point. They do it, that's huge plantar flexion, but there you go. Inversion and eversion is, a, is the ankle motion in and out, okay? That's when you sprain your ankle, you're probably, you're everting it and you're getting the, the lateral aspect of the ankle is tearing it. And those are the four planes of motion. The foot, yay. Again, diagnosis related impairments, amputation, I should say. Measure the level of amputation. The whole foot is a 25% whole person impairment rating, but the gray toe is divided into two sections. The first is the IP joint. Okay, that's the big knuckle in your great toe. If it's distal to that, it's a 1% whole person impairment rating. If it's at the MTP, metatarsal phalangeal joint, that's a 2% whole person impairment rating. If it's any other of the little piggies, it's 1% per piggy, uh, irrespective of where it is. So if I take off the great toe and the, the uh, uh, second toe and the, and the middle toe, that would be a 4% whole person impairment rating. But be cautious. Was the amputation a function of your injury or a function of diabetes and they had no blood supply? And that's a whole separate conversation. So we talked about the upper extremity and the lower extremity. And let's talk about the most common one, which is the spine. Good news is, where is the injury? Because well, it's either the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, or the lumbar spine. Be very careful because there are some people who will use this crossover terminology of, come on computer, cervical thoracic or thoracolumbar. And the reason for that is a thoracolumbar, if they default from a lumbar and they call it thoracolumbar, it goes, the impairment ratings can be higher, particularly at DRE3. So look at the exact location of the injury. L1 slash L2 is a lumbar spine injury, and that's specifically noted in the AMA guides, okay? Uh, T1 to T12, thoracic. C1 to, uh, to T C8 is cervical. I bring it up, if we talk about a, a cause of a thoracic lumbar and it's a DRE3, then all of a sudden lumbar spine is 10%, thoracic, thoracic spine is 15%, and nothing precipitates pursuing SIBs like having a 15% impairment rating. So diagnosis related estimate, DRE, is the preferred method as noted in the AMA guides and by the appeals panel. Remember the impairment rating is done at the time of maximum medical improvement and versus the date of injury. I bring that up because if you understand the guides and the diagnosis related estimate, they tried to establish what the impairment rating would be at the time of injury. Clearly our statute says impairment ratings are at the time of maximum medical improvement. So if I had a severe lumbar injury, and as a clinician, I know there's gonna be a fusion surgery at multiple levels, all of a sudden it's a DRE5 for 25% because a lot of stuff is going to happen. It may or may not happen, okay? So surgery versus motion segment integrity loss are not a consideration. Page 72, left-hand column, third paragraph down. Again, prove me I have no life, so I read the guides a lot. Uh, surgery to treat an injury does not change the impairment rating. 
And there was an attempt to several about you know, 10, 12 years ago to say, oh, if we had a lumbar fusion, by default, it would be a DRE5 for 25%. And that is not what the fourth edition of the guides say. And there were, if those of you can remember, it went through the whole court process, the Supreme Court got involved and ultimately held, yes, surgery to treat an injury doesn't change the impairment rating. So the question becomes meeting the definitions for the different guidelines. And uh, there's an asterisk here for a reason. I'll talk about that in a second. But at the time of maximum medical improvement, the only question you have to ask is, is there a verifiable radiculopathy? If the answer is yes, it's a DRE3. Cervical, thoracic, or lumbar, <coughs> it's a DRE3. And in the cervical thoracic, that's a 15% whole person impairment rating. In the lumbar spine, it's only a 10% whole person impairment rating. Wait a minute. This individual had a two level lumbar fusion surgery. Whoa, big injury. Is it yours or not? The whole separate question. But if at the time of max medical improvement, the surgery was successful and there is no objectification of a verifiable radiculopathy, that individual would have a DRE two level impairment rating of 5%. Is that fair? I would tell you that I have read the third edition, the third revised edition, fourth, fifth, and sixth edition. In all those books, 2,000 pages of text, there is one word that doesn't appear. That word is fair. There's nothing fair about this. This is an arbitrary system to establish some consistency. So if they have a uh, radiculopathy, DRE3, if they don't, DRE2. Now, uh, we, one of my docs recently took the designated doctor training two weeks ago. Uh, fortunately, it was virtual, so he didn't get stuck here in Austin during the snowstorm. But what they're teaching you is that at the AMA guy, the training is, do the, it's a situation at MMI. Now, the definition says, is there a history of muscle guarding that has been documented by a physician? As per the guides, that would be a DRE2 level impairment rating. However, the designated doctor training says, no, they don't have muscle guarding now, therefore it's a DRE1, which is good news for you, but I think it's somewhat unfair when you look at the, all the parameters of the guides, but you should be aware that a DRE1 or 0% can be assigned in somebody who had a specific lumbar surgery. And depending on the physical examination at the time of surgery, if there was no guarding and no radiculopathy and no significant findings, even though they had surgery, it could be a DRE1 for 0%. I don't know if that's ever gonna happen, but it could, and you should be aware of it. There is a range of motion model in the guys to throw back to the third edition, and this is only a differentiator. I have seen several non-physician designated doctors use the range of motion model to establish which DRE category they should select, that is completely wrong. Don't use it, don't allow it. If they even talk about the additional validity criterion, throw the whole thing out. As noted in the guides, this model can help you if you're trying to determine between DRE6 and DRE7, that could be an additional piece of information, but it's not the basis for the impairment rating. That particular statement was noted in a number of past appeals panel decision going back a number of years. So we talked about upper extremity, lower extremity, and spine. Let's talk about the brain and neurologic system, nervous system. Remember, this chapter four addresses only the brain and spinal cord. When doing a traumatic brain injury, is there a functional loss? Because if there is, there are nine separate categories they have to assess. And the pimmering process is, okay, out of the first five, you pick the single largest number. So if I had 0, 5, 5, 5, 25, boom, 25%. And then out of the next remaining sections up to nine, you would combine those values in. So 25 combined with five, combined with four, or whatever the number might be. So if you have a significant brain injury, there it is. But there needs to be objectification of a specific functional loss. Guys, uh, you know, get... We see frequently, particularly after uh, uh, going to uh, different providers, 
that the, they were in a car accident, they were seat belted, there was no airbag deployment, and they have headaches. Well, headaches are pain, and pain cannot serve as a basis for an impairment rating. So is there a functional loss? Or they had a, a blunt force trauma to the head, they got hit in the head with a hammer, or whatever, but there's no bleeding, there's no trauma, nothing on MRI, nothing on CAT scan. Was there a brain injury? Really hard to prove. And this is where you have to get folks involved early on. But is there aphasias or other things or, uh, like that that can compromise that person? But there are specific parameters that has to be objectified and not based on subjective symptomology. Other than that, brain spinal cord use chapter three. Uh, and people default to chapter, well, we'll talk about it in the psych issue in a few seconds. But again, this is for the brain and spinal cord alone. Respiratory, it's based on pulmonary function testing. And I would strongly urge you to make sure that you get or ask the doctor to get them along the way. We had one case a few years ago where this person was exposed to some chemical at a, one of the plants down, in, uh, the, uh, down by Houston or Pasadena somewhere. And <clears throat> they were blowing great PFTs. And a pulmonary function test is like a little cardboard tube about the size of the toilet paper roll. And you take a deep breath in, and blow out as hard as you can. <sighs> big wind, like the big bad wolf blowing down the piggy's house. Okay, but wait, it's time for my impairment rating. So what am I going to do? Big breath in and <sighs> don't even blow up a balloon with that. And of course, there's no pulmonary function, and then you get a higher impairment rating. The appeals panel says you need three. The guides don't, but it's a good idea to get them along the way. And if you get three separate appeals uh, uh, PFTs at different occasions, it's a thing. This is objective testing and straightforward. However, it is subject to physician variance and participation on the, on the part of the injured employee. Visual system, this is rather straightforward. It's the best corrected vision. With my glasses on, 20-20 both eyes, yay, 0% impairment rating. Glasses off, if I'm driving, there's gonna be a car accident because I'm 2200 one eye and 21, something in the other eye, okay? Uh, it just like, here it is. So boom, 2020, so it's best corrected vision. And the impairment rating is to be limited to the injury sustained. So if there was somebody who got a, a rock in one eye, okay, fine, he had a visual in acuity for the right eye, but the left eye is treated like it's normal, 0%. So if it was like me where my left eye is 2200 and for, for whatever reason I can't, doesn't correct, I shouldn't get an impairment rating for an ordinary disease of life. So again, limit the impairment rating to the compensable injury sustained. And if it's a single eye injury, you take those values and, and, and go by zero on tables six, seven, uh, and, and do all that before you calculate the impairment rating. If there is a complete loss of visual acuity in one eye, that's a 24% whole person impairment rating. I would tell you two years ago, I would be getting a phone call from adjusters looking to set their reserves because they had a guy who lost an eye or a huge penetrating injury and it was not, not coming back and they had no idea. So 24%. <laughs> if you do have an eye injury and it's not coming back, there you go. Both eyes, 85% whole person impairment rating for blindness. And I'm here to tell you, that's not enough from my perspective, but that's what the guides allow for. Also, when you're looking at the eye examination, make sure that the ophthalmologist or optician has done those things to eliminate malingering. You know, they're, they're going to test one or two, two or three, one or three, and they're going to try to find out if there's consistency as opposed to, well, sometimes these injured employees are not the most reliable or the, the, the veracity is not established. <coughs> Ear, nose, and throat. Smell. I mean, this. There. If you had a head injury and you blow out the uh, fifth cranial nerve, you can lose a complete loss of smell, anosmia. Now, in this situation, you know, in today's situation, who hasn't heard of loss of smell as being part of COVID? Okay. And the question then becomes: If you if you have accepted a COVID diagnosis, and I would be very very cautious about that. And I can tell you some horror stories about that's that scenario, but. Is it reasonably presumed to be permanent? Because what I've read is, although people do lose their smell, it comes back. It may take a few months, 
but it does come back. And if you're doing a COVID impairment rating and you've got to address this issue, it can be an additional three points. Mastication TMJ, all right. Back in the early 90s, TMJ was a fairly common workers' comp injury. The good news is it's gone away for the most part uh, and, and for good reason, because the science doesn't back it up. That point notwithstanding, if you did see somebody who was in a car wreck and he got an injury to the TMJ or jaw, <clears throat> um, how do you do the impairment rating? And it's based on the functionality of chewing. So this is one situation where I think you'd need to have a meeting with the injured employee, probably at a very nice steakhouse and see how he does with the steak you buy him and by yourself, because is he limited on semi-solid, soft, or liquid diet? So if he puts that steak down, he's got no loss, no basis for impairment rating, and of course you got to take meal out of the deal, which is how I would roll. But there you go. So what what can this person do again on a reasonably presumed to be permanent basis? And there are some situations where people are limited to liquid foods, and that would be a drag unless your choice is Jack Daniels and I could probably live on that for a while. Mental and behavioral disorders. And who amongst us isn't just a little bit crazy, but it can be if I, you need to get a psych evaluation, okay? And the impairment rating is based on four functional areas. And these are concentration, adaptation, social functioning, and activities of daily living. And I've seen way too many assessments that are done by PhD psychologists or MED, psychiatrists, whatever they're called, licensed social workers or whatever, and they don't do it. They say, oh, Mr. Abrams uh, has a 30% impairment rating because of his mental dysfunction. Wait, based on what? And there's some really easy questions you could ask. Did Mr. Abrams drive to the examination? Yes. Well, then if he can drive a car by himself, he can concentrate or he can adapt to people stopping in front of him or red lights or whatever. And assuming he didn't get into involved in a road rage situation, he can function socially and manage his activities of daily living. If you look at it, just about every psychiatric report, they'll say, Mr. Evans presented well-dressed, well-nourished, things like that. And they're focusing on the ADLs and social functioning as part of their overall assessment. So before you assign or accept this impairment rating, make sure they use the four functional areas. And now what a lot of providers will do is they'll take one of these four and they'll go back to chapter four for the brain injury one as a roadmap, if you will, mild, moderate, severe, this is 25%, 50% or whatever. And that's probably a better way to do it. It's not outlined in the guides to do that, but it has been accepted model because you get to pick a number. If I see Mr. Abrams, and I think he's got a social function impairment rating, I could say he's 5% impaired, okay? Or if I'm feeling particularly generous, I could say he's 55% impaired and there is no base to establish either number. I can't shoot down a, a number if a guy just picks a number for social functioning and does it. There is no ordinal scale. And that's why people go to chapter four to help them sort out <clears throat> mild, moderate, or severe. But you should know, page 292, chapter 14, page 292, an episode of depression is an isolated event and not deserved to be permanent. Therefore, it's not impairable. So they said, oh, he's depressed. I'm going to give him an extra 10 points of impairment rating. Wait a minute. Here it is, page 292, not reasonably presumed to be permanent. <clears throat> Therefore, it's not impairable. Who doesn't get depressed? I don't know about you, but I've been on Kansas City last uh, February lost a few bananas, I was depressed, okay? I really thought Tom Brady couldn't pull it off again. He did, and they're like, I'm out the money. Pain. Pain is not used as a basis for uh, impairment. The appeals panel has ruled against pain. Pain is subjective, and therefore it's not impairable. However, there is chapter 15. I will tell you in the past 20 years, I've seen four different times when people have attempted to use chapter 15. Therefore, they're learning you can't do that, but it is there. I just wanted to make sure you were aware of it. I hope this is a, guys, as always, thank you so much for participating. 
Uh, I'm sorry we had to cancel last time in the storm. I'm sure we were all negatively impacted by it, but this was a really quick trip uh, through the AMA guides. And just so you know, are there any questions? Alex, are there any questions? No. No, okay. I guess I did a good job. There's no questions. But if you have something pop up, please give me a call. This is my cell. It's always on. Uh, or email me at dabrams.com, pythonconsultants.com. I'm happy to help you out at no charge if you have a question about this process. So I can be reached. There's our social media stuff, which I do not understand. Alex does. And that's why we pay her. And uh, we'll go from there. And if there's no questions, guys, thank you so much for your time. We'll talk soon.